My name is Keshwani. It's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 141. Day 3141, three is to indicate to, to, to signify the fact that we are in the third edition, third edition, day 141. We are in the process of solving the problem for the practice test that you will find at the end of the book on page number 362. Yesterday we, yesterday we finished the previous section, section 5, and today we'll begin section number 6. Problem number 1, as you can see, is already on the blackboard. Let's take a look at it. We are told that one US dollar is 0.93 is equal to 0.93 Argentinian peso. We are further told that one US dollar is equal to 32 Kenyan shillings. And we have to compare these two values. One Argentinian peso, well we can clearly see here that 0.93 is almost one, which means one Argentinian peso, it could be argued, because it's 0.93, we could, we could treat that, we could treat this 0.193 as equal to one which means one Argentinian peso is almost equal to one dollar. One Argentinian peso is almost equal to one dollar. In fact, actually, it's worth more than a dollar. It's worth more than a dollar because if you had one US dollar, you'll only get 93 of their Argentinian peso. If you want to get 100 of them, you're going to have to pay a dollar. You, you know, not, not 100, rather. If you want to get a one whole peso, if, if you want to get one whole peso, you'll have to pay more than a dollar. So their peso, one peso, is actually worth more than a dollar. But it's safe to say that it's approximately one dollar. Whereas over here, they give us 33 shillings, but if you like, we can just, we can just pretend that it's approximately 33 shillings. Had it been equal to 33 shillings, what does it tell us, the value of one shilling? One shilling is approximately three US cents. Three US cents, because 33 shillings, if each of them is worth three, three cents, if you were to multiply that, multiply that by three, you'll get 99 US cents, which is approximately one dollar. In other words, one dollar is approximately 33 of their shillings, even though it's 32. If, if one dollar is 33 or 32 shilling, one shilling is worth approximately three cents versus one dollar, of course, is far bigger. An Argentinian peso is worth far more than a Kenyan shilling from Kenya in Africa. Number two. K, we are told, is a digit in the decimal 1.3K5. And we are further told that this 1.3K5 that we see here, it is in fact less than 1.33. And we are, to, we are to compare in column A the value of K versus column B, which is 1. Well, what can we conclude? We do know that this decimal that they're giving us is, in fact, has to be less than 1.33. Well, if it's less than 1.33, it could very well be 1.305. 1.305 is still less than, is still less than 1.33 or it could be 1.315 and it is still less than 1.33 or it could very well be or it could very well be 1.1.325 and it will still work what do we conclude what we conclude is that the scale that is given to us in place of the tenth digit or rather tenth digit tenth with the th the k that is given to us which represents the no no not the tenth digit k i'm not using my brain uh, this is this not, not that it matters here, do you understand? But it is actually hundredth digit, th. The k that is given to us in the hundredth digit here could very well be, could very well be zero. It would still work, or it could be one, or it could be two. And we're being asked to compare, so k is equal to either zero or one or two. And in the second column we have one. If, if in second column we have one, if k is equal to zero, if k happens to be zero, in other words, if the decimal in question happens to be 1.035, in that case the answer would be B. If K happens to be exactly 1, then the answer would be C. If K happens to be 2, the answer would turn to A. The answer is D. Answer is D. 
Oh, I forgot to tell you. Question number two that we just finished. 73% of the people had no trouble with it. Three quarters of the people, almost three quarters of the people got it right. Question number one that we just finished a little while ago. Question number one that we just finished. About two thirds of the people. About two thirds of the people had no trouble with it. A third of the people missed it. But this one, only about a quarter of the people missed it. Let's do number three. Sometimes if something is too simple and you try to explain it too much, it just gets to be too, too annoying. In number three, we are told that uh, the segment AB in the picture that we are about to draw represents the diameter of the circle. So we're given a circle here. Let's erase this thing. We no longer need it. We're given a circle here. And we are told that the segment AB represents the diameter. Even though even though the picture that they gave us, they do not actually show us the center of the circle. But if they tell you that AB is diameter, it must obviously go through center. Otherwise, it's not going to work. That's what diameter is. And then they give you two other lines. AC and AD. Before we do any work at all, we know AB is diameter. What do we, what do we call a line that joins two points in the circle? What do we call a line that joins two points in the circle? but does not go through center. If it does not go through center, what do we call such a line? Do we know it? These terms are necessary for us to know because in the exam sometimes they employ these terms. If they're talking and they employ the term, we have to know what they're talking about. This is called a code. This is called a code. So we have a code here and we have a code here. And then we have the diameter. This is the diameter. It's the diameter, not because, not because they show us going through center, not because they tell us that, they, or sometimes they tell you that it's the center and they show a line going through the center, then they don't have to tell us that it's the diameter. Here they don't show the center, but they, they do tell you specifically, explicitly, that it's, it is a diameter. Let's see what they're asking us to compare. In column A, in column A we have the length of AB, which, which we know is the diameter, even though we don't know what the diameter is. And in column B, they are taking the average of AC, the chord AC, and the length of the chord AD, divided by 2. Divided by 2. Let's see how they actually phrase it. It says the average of the length AC and AD, which is what I just showed you. So what can we say here? Oh, it's very simple. Diameter obviously has to be longer than the chord. That is the definition of diameter. That's the longest line that you can have joining two points in a circle if it goes to the center. So let's, if, if it makes it easier, let's put in some number. Let's assume that diameter is equal to 5. If diameter is equal to 5, then the chord, both of these chords would have to be less than 5. Let's pretend they have, they are 4.9 and 4.8. Whatever it is, it's less than 5. Do you understand? If you have two values, both less than 5, 4.9 and 4.8, they are both less than 5, or even if you want to go, even if you want to go to the extreme of, of 4.99, plus 4.98 if you take the average of the two numbers they are, which are both less than 5 the average of the two numbers they are both less than 5 would always have to be less than the 5 because they are both less than 5 so the average of any two chords or any number of chords as a matter of fact it, you can instead of two chords instead of two chords we could have drawn 2000 chords and then divide by 2000 the average length average length of any number of chords in a given circle would always be less than the diameter because diameter is the longest one because when you're taking the average each one of them is going to be shorter than the diameter that's it so the average of the two chords is less than the diameter obviously that was number that was number number three the answer of course we have it here the answer is a the answer is a and in this case about half the people got it right about half the people got this question right but it is frightening to see, to, to, to understand, uh, to realize that rather, that half the people missed it, almost half the people. Number, number four. Number four, we are told that S times T is the square root of 10. S times T is the square root of 10. And in column A, we have S squared. 
in column A we have s squared and in column B we have 10 over 10 over t squared and our job of course is to compare the two columns as always nothing new about it but before we do the comparison let's let's see what we can do here in terms of simplification I don't like this business of putting t squared at the bottom here. Let's get rid of this, this, let's get rid of this denominator. We're going to multiply both columns by t squared. Multiply this column by t squared. Multiply this column by t squared. As long as you treat, as long as you treat both columns by the same, in the same manner. If you multiply both columns by the same number, if you divide both columns by the same number, if you add or subtract the same number from the two columns, you're okay. Provided, there's only one condition, provided that we do not go around multiplying it by a negative number. For example, let me give you a quick example, a quick digression, a quick digression, column A, column A, and column B. 3 and 4, which one is bigger? Of course, 4 is bigger. But instead of 3 versus 4, if we were to multiply both columns by say 2, now which one is bigger? Of course, this is still bigger. But instead of multiplying it by 2, if you were to multiply both columns by negative 2, then this is wrong. Negative 8 is not greater than negative 6. The direction of the inequality switches. So that's the only exception that we have to remember. If you multiply or divide both columns by a negative number, we must remember to switch the, switch the direction of the inequality. The direction of column A becomes column B and column A, B becomes A. But don't do that. So don't get into this complication. Just don't multiply the two columns by a negative number. Avoid that complication. So as long as you multiply both columns by the same number, or you divide both columns by the same number, or add or subtract the same numbers to both columns, you're fine. And of course, how do we know that this is a, what we are multiplying both columns by the positive quantity? We don't. We don't know what t is. But we do know that whatever the t is, whether positive or negative, even if it happens to be negative, when you, multi when you square the negative quantity, it will become positive. So even if t is negative, when you square it, it becomes positive. And therefore, we're multiplying both columns by a positive quantity. We know for a fact, and that we are allowed to do. Enough said. The whole point is to get rid of the t squared. So here we go, t squared is 1 here. And here we get s squared times t squared. Let's, let's, take, this, let, let's take what is given to us here. Let's take this what is given to us and, and square both sides. And when we square both sides, we'll end up with s squared times t squared equals 100. Oh, no, not 100. It's 10, rather. Square, square, square of, the square, the square of the square root of some quantity will simply be the quantity that we have in the square root. It will become 10. And here also we have 10, because after we get rid of this thing, what we're left here is 10. 10 versus 10, they are both equal. The answer is c. Answer is C. More than half the people missed it. Only 46% of the people. Only 46% of the people got it right. That was number four. Let's move on to number five. In number five. In number five, we are told three consecutive integers have have sum of negative eighty four of negative eighty four in column A. We have the least of the three integers. And keep in mind that they are asking us to compare with the least of the three. In column B, that is important to keep in mind. You understand? We have negative 28. What, what can we do here? Let's not put column B so far out because I need the room to work. I shouldn't have put any of this thing out. So, in column B we have 28, just remember it and let's do the work. Now we are told that the sum is negative 24. Do you understand? The sum of three consecutive integers is 20, negative 28, yeah, negative 84. And since I used up so much space, I'm going to have to erase all of this thing. Let's do, our, let's do our work. Let's find out what these three integers are, such that when we add them, they add up to negative 84. 
they have to be consecutive let's add them now if we're gonna we're gonna solve it algebraically you understand and when you when, whenever it is that you want to set up something algebraically whenever you want to use algebra to find the unknown quantity it is always important it is essential it is absolutely crucial that you define your unknown or unknowns if there are more than one from the very beginning from the onset from the very beginning we must define our unknown we must lay it out clearly what they are so let 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 n let n be the the least of the three integers the least of the three integers you understand whatever it is that they want us to compare we're going to call it n so here we're going to what goes here is n we're going to find the value of it so if n is the least of them if n is the least of them and since they are consecutive if n is the least of them what's the next one if you have three consecutive numbers such as three four five well if three is the least one the next one is going to be three plus one and the next one after that is going to be one one after that is going to be four plus one or three plus one plus one so the next one is going to be n plus 1 and the one after that is going to be n plus 2 and we know they have to add up to negative 84 all we have to do is solve that equation the simple equation and we'll know what n is do you understand? so n, n and n we have 3 n's and then we have plus 1 and plus 2 plus 3 equals negative 84 let's, let's divide the entire column by 3 Let's divide the entire column by 3. How do we know that 84 is divisible by 3? How do we know How do you know if any number is divisible by 3? It's very simple. We look at the sum of the digit SUM sum of the digit. The sum of 84 is 8 plus 4 which is 12 and since 12 is divisible by 3, 84 is divisible by 3. Let me rewrite that 84. I don't like the way it is written. It looks quite ugly. Only. Let's divide the entire column by 3 very quickly. Too much explanation here. Dividing the entire, entire equation by 3 simply means dividing every single term on both sides by 3. So let's do it. Divide this side, this column by this, this term by 3, this term by 3, and that term by 3. And of course the whole point is to get rid of this 3 from here. It becomes n. 3 divided by 3 is 1. And what do we get here? How many 3's does 8 have? 8 has, 8 has 2 3's. Don't forget we have a negative here that's going to go on the top. 8 has 2 3's. 2 3's are 6. After we take away 6 from the 8, we have a remainder of 2. What happens to the 2? 2 goes and joins the 4 and becomes 24. And 24 has 8 3's. 8 3's are 24. Since we divided, since we divided the top by 3, we must divide the bottom by 3, which was the whole point. So we end up with negative 28. We have to get rid of this one here. Let's subtract 1 from both sides. And we find that n, this is going to cancel out, n equals negative 1 and negative, negative 28, negative 29, negative 29. So if n is equal to negative 29, if n is equal to negative 29, the next one of course is going to be one more than that, so it's negative 30, negative 31, and when we add them up, we should get what we have, which is, we are told the negative 84. 9 plus 1 is 0, carry 1, we get 9, oh, we get negative 90. But the problem tells us that the sum has to be negative 84. What the bloody hell is going on, you think? What is going on here? What mistake did we make here? A mistake we made is exactly what we told us, what we, we reminded ourselves from the very beginning not to do, which to keep in mind what n is. n is supposed to be the least of the three integers. n is the least one. We found n to be negative 29. And if n is the least one, why doesn't it add up? If they're supposed to add up to 84. Why doesn't it work out? Because if n is the least one, negative 29, then what's the one, what's the one next after, what's the one that comes after that, the one bigger than negative 29? One that is going to be bigger than negative 29, if you have a number line here, if this is negative 29, the next that is bigger, because 0 is somewhere here, the next that is bigger is negative 28, and then negative 27. Negative 29 is the smallest one, not the biggest one. And th in the work that we just did here, it shows that, negative 29 is the biggest one. This is wrong. We should have added up. Our three numbers are going to be, our three numbers are going to be, okay, where can we do it? Our three numbers are going to be, negative 29 is the least one. So it's going to be negative 29, the one after that is negative 28, and the one after that is negative 27. And these three numbers, if we add up, they should add up to 84. 
they should add up to 84. Uh, you see 8, this is 7 which is one, 1 less than 8 and this is 9 which is 1 more than 8 which means the sum of these three numbers is going to be 8 times 3. 8 times 3 is 24. 4, carry 2, there you go, you see it checks out. But the point here is that the smallest number is negative 29. The point was the smallest number is negative 29. What did we have in column B? I forget what was in column B. Oh, negative 28. In column B, in column B, we have negative 28. So we're comparing negative 28 versus negative 29. And which one is bigger? Again, you have to remember that negative 28 is in fact bigger than negative 29. Negative 28 is in fact bigger than 29, which means the answer is B. Which means that the answer is B. Answer is B. Let me give you quickly the percentile. More than half the people again missed it. More than half the people missed it. Only 48% of the people had luck on it. 52% did not get this one right. Let me take a quick look at number 6 and see what, what we want to do with it. No, let's not go into 6 here because 6 is a little bit involved. 6 is a little bit involved. We'll do, we'll do number 6. We'll pick up from number 6 tomorrow. Okay? Okay, bye now.